People have always tried to explain behavior, human and otherwise, but some behaviors are more difficult to explain than others. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. We know why most school children can cite the Pledge of Allegiance. They've been taught to do so. We call this rote learning. With liberty and justice for all. But how do we explain a child's first words? Alpha. Why is it that only humans can communicate using symbols? We know how a child learns to avoid being burned with hot food. It usually only takes one burn and the child won't touch it again. We call this simple conditioning. Some behaviors are far more mysterious. A one-year-old child will react to its mirror image as if it's seeing another child, but a two-year-old will react to its image as a reflection of itself. How do we explain this phenomenon? It's easy to explain why a child will reach into a cookie jar. The child has gotten cookies by doing so. But what about those exciting instances that every parent has proudly observed? When a child is confronted with a difficult situation and a creative problem-solving kind of behavior seems to emerge mysteriously. In casual conversation, we often attempt to explain these interesting behaviors by saying the child is intelligent, thinks creatively, or uses reason. Psychologists have borrowed many of these terms from laymen and have added many similar ones of their own, such as mental image, self, and ego. Behavioral psychologists argue that such terms don't really explain anything. Many are only inferences from behavior and cannot therefore be used to explain it. 
Behaviorists assert that all our behavior, no matter how complex, is the result of our genes and our environmental history. Until recently, behaviorists have studied only relatively simple behaviors in the laboratory and have only speculated about how simple processes might account for more complex behaviors. But in 1979 at Harvard University, Robert Epstein and B.F. Skinner began a unique series of experiments which brought complex behavior into the laboratory. Prompted by increasing reports from primate laboratories in which behavior was attributed to mental processes, they began confronting head-on some of the thorniest issues in the analysis of complex behavior. Well, one very good example was a paper which claimed to show that chimpanzees could communicate with each other, expressing ideas and so on. They did tell you about the extensive training that their animals had, and they then turned around and attributed the behavior they were observing, not to the training, but to the uh, information and knowledge that the chimps possessed, to a message that was being transmitted from one to the other, uh, to the intentions uh, of the chimps and that kind of thing. In other words, they turned around and interpreted this behavior in everyday human uh, cognitive terms. And so we arranged a situation in which uh, pigeons would do even more complicated uh, communication, if that's what you're going to call it, and did indeed uh, succeed in uh, getting what certainly looks like the behavior of a speaker and the behavior of a listener. Epstein and Skinner, with colleague Robert Lanza, trained two pigeons whom they named Jack and Jill over a five-week period, using standard laboratory techniques called shaping, fading, chaining, and discrimination training. Jack and Jill could observe each other through a clear plastic partition and could each peck plastic keys on the panel in front of them. Jack's task was to peck one of three colors, red, green, or yellow, which matched a color only Jill could see. When conditioning was complete, Jack, the bird on the left, initiated each exchange by pecking and thus illuminating a sign on his side of the partition labeled, what color? Jill, the bird on the right, then thrust her head through a curtain on her side of the chamber where a color was illuminated. She then pecked the corresponding letter on her panel, R for red, G for green, and Y for yellow. Having seen this, Jack pecked a sign labeled, thank you, operating Jill's feeder for a few seconds. Finally, Jack pecked the color key corresponding to the letter Jill had illuminated, and this response operated Jack's feeder for a few seconds. After feeding, Jack then initiated a new exchange. Watch the exchange in slow motion. Jack pecks what color? Jill thrusts her head behind the curtain and then pecks the letter corresponding to the color she has seen as Jack watches her closely. Jack pecks the thank you key as Jill looks on intently. Finally, Jack pecks the color key which operates his feeder. The birds engaged in this exchange with greater than 90% accuracy for extended periods of time. A new color appeared at random behind the curtain after each trial. Incorrect pecks turned the chamber lights off for a few seconds. But as scientists, I don't think we can claim that we learned much new from this exchange. Uh, what we, it was really more a, a demonstration than anything else. What we had done was, simp was, was show that uh, that some environmental history, a certain set of experiences, if you will, can, can produce very complicated language-like behavior in simple organisms. We had an apparatus in which we had one pigeon talking to another, and we exchanged the roles. They could go either way. Either pigeon could be a speaker, and either one could be a listener. It was a natural thing to do, to take out the partition and put just one pigeon in and see whether it would, in a sense, talk to itself. And that's what actually happened. After a few minutes in this situation, a smooth sequence of behaviors emerged. Jack thrust his head behind the curtain where the color was illuminated and then, although not required to do so, pecked the corresponding letter key. He then moved to the left side of the chamber and pecked the appropriate color key, often looking back at the illuminated letter key. It seemed the pigeon was using the letter keys as humans use a memorandum. In casual terms, the pigeon pecked the letter key to help it remember the hidden color. Both birds repeated the sequence thousands of times. We did a series of tests over a period of about uh, five months 
uh, that convinced us anyway that our guess, our original uh, guess was right, that these pigeons were indeed using the symbol keys as we use memoranda. Uh, for example, we found that if we would remove the curtain from in front of the hidden color, uh, thus making the task much easier, uh, a Jack or Jill, uh, after a period of weeks, would, would stop using the, the symbol keys. That is, it would simply go color to color. Color, yellow, and then walk across the chamber and, um, and peck yellow. If we then made the task harder by reintroducing the curtain, uh, the, at least one of the pigeons went back to using uh, the symbol keys and, and virtually without error. Uh, with Jill, we made the task even harder still by introducing a delay between her peck at the, the hidden color and the availability of the color keys on the left-hand side of the chamber. And when we made that delay long enough, her, 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 um, she made more and more errors until finally uh, she began pecking at those letter keys to bridge the delay. Well, we feel that under these circumstances, two repertoires which we had set up separately, speaker and listener, actually came together quite spontaneously. We did not train the bird to use a memorandum. We trained it to be a speaker and a listener, and quite without uh, exception, it began to talk to itself. I think we had, we had seen in the memorandum experiment uh, the emergence of genuinely uh, new behavior. We had seen the emergence of behavior that could be interpreted in human terms, that was meaningful in human terms, and that it, it, was, it was functionally distinct. I mean, it did something new. We became increasingly interested simply in sources of new behavior, sources of novelty that are not particularly mysterious, but where the controlling stimuli are, are readily apparent. Uh, one such source, for example, that's very important uh, for children is uh, imitation. Apple. Say apple. Apple. We had planned uh, simply to teach one pigeon to imitate another and then to see whether this tendency to imitate would generalize to new responses. Uh, we had taken it for granted when we began this work that there, there wouldn't be much in the way of spontaneous imitation, that we would have to teach the imitation to begin with. And then, uh, to our surprise, one day, one of our undergraduate uh, research assistants uh, literally ran into the office and, and said that uh, one of the, the pigeons she was working with was spontaneously imitating another bird that was, that was getting reinforcement for, uh, I believe it was pecking a ping pong ball. I had actually made a mistake many years ago. I tried to show imitation in a pigeon and hadn't got it. And in the textbook, which I'm now sorry about, I said that animals at that level imitate only when the behavior is uh, instinctive behavior. But what we did was to set up a situation in which one pigeon seeing another behaving in a particular way would have an opportunity uh, to imitate. And to our surprise, that happened.